Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In our last episode, we looked at the cost of Rebel Alliance snub fighters. This was a military organization which heavily depended on their starfighter core for most military operations. These ships had to be reliable, powerful, and independently operate from a fleet for weeks if not months at a time. And this is primarily because the Rebel Alliance, especially in the earlier years of the war, had difficulties raising a proper fleet that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Imperial ship of the line. And so today we'll be continuing our cost of ship series by taking a look at the Rebel Alliance's capital ships and other larger vessels. The CR-90 was the first starship to appear in Star Wars on screen. The all-Iranian diplomatic vessel 10-4 at the time was being chased down by an Imperial-class Star Destroyer over Tatooine. The CR-90 Corvette was a Krillin engineering product, but unlike its freighter line, this ship was designed from the get-go to be special, without relying on any aftermarket upgrades. A quick glance at the rear of the CR-90 and you'll see no less than 11 ion turbine engines, which gives this ship a ridiculously high sublight speed. It makes it perfect for running blockades as the CR-90 would often do during the Clone Wars on behalf of Republic diplomatic missions, and later on for the Rebel Alliance against the Empire. In the early years of the Alliance to restore the Republic, prominent senators like Bail Organa would essentially take their government-appointed diplomatic vessel and use them for illicit activities like recruiting more rebels to the cause or even smuggling weapons. The CR-90 was not only extremely fast, it also had several turbo lasers on board so it could even deal with other capital ships. It also had docking points that were external for starfighters. And so in those earlier years of the rebellion, the CR-90 was basically used as a ship of the line or even a command ship. CR-90's new costs around 3.5 to 2.7 million credits, but a used one could go for as low as 1.5 million credits. Next up, we have one of the most hated starships in the Rebel Alliance. This is the GR-75 Medium Transport, which essentially was a shell-shaped container with engines on the back of it. The GR-75 was commonly used for shipping products within systems or shorter range travel. It was also used to ferry supplies from ships in orbit to the ground. Its main claim to fame was its role in the successful evacuation of Echo Base on Hoth. These things are basically just fat tunas waiting to get picked off by pirates and TIE fighters, and so you're almost going to have to assign an escort to these things or else risk losing everything inside. At 90 meters in length and with minimal armor and shielding along with a ridiculously slow Class 4 hyperdrive, the GR-75 was very overpriced at 180,000 credits. You're almost better off getting the smaller but more heavily armored and armed Gazanti class cruiser for around 200,000. Or better yet, yeah, just get the next ship on our list. The Sphirna class Hammerhead Corvette claimed its fame during the Battle of Scarif when the badly damaged Lightmaker slammed into the disabled ISD Persecutor and pushed it into another Star Destroyer known as the Intimidator. These two ships would disintegrate once they struck each other, and their combined mass would fall into the planet's gravity well, which would take out the shield gate over Scarif as well. This is probably one of the most lopsided and efficient kills by a tiny ship ever done. But then again, we are in Star Wars, and I vaguely remember an X-Wing and N1 Starfighter pulling off similarly spectacular and unbalanced feats. The Strainer class Hammerhead was a Corellian Engineering Corporation ship of the Corvette class, but its design was inspired by the Hammerhead cruisers utilized by the Old Republic more than a thousand years ago. Like these older ships, the Strainer featured a heavily armored cockpit and several forward-facing weapons. This means that the Hammerhead Corvette is designed for a very aggressive, forward-facing offensive attacks. During the Battle of Scarif, this 1 million credit ship was able to take out two Star Destroyers, easily worth hundreds of millions of credits, along with that priceless shield gate. I would definitely recommend getting this over the GR-75. In the early days before the Mon Calamari joined the Rebellion, the largest ship in the Rebel Alliance fledgling navy was the EF-76 Nebulon B Escort Frigate. This ship was designed by Quat Drive Yards for the Imperial Navy as a cost-saving alternative to the Imperial-class Star Destroyer. It's a lot smaller and designed for those more remote parts of the galaxy where you don't need as large of a ship. The Nebulon B was heavily armed with point defense weapons and had a few turbo lasers to deal with enemy capital ships as well. It was quite a formidable ship, but against the Star Destroyers that it was supposed to replace in less important theaters, it didn't really stand much of a chance. The Nebulon B frigate was around 300 meters long, and for the most part, it was used as a command ship and a hospital ship by the Rebellion. 
The Nebula MB Escort Frigate cost a whopping 8.5 million credits, but thankfully most of the Rebel Alliance's Nebula MBs were stolen from the Empire. The Pelta-class frigate from Quad Drive Yards is another Clone Wars holdover. Utilized by both sides of the war, the Pelta-class was mostly used as a transport ship for delivering supplies and relief or for medical purposes. The Rebel Alliance would adopt the Pelta-class in the early days of the war. Phoenix L, a famous Rebel unit that was active in the Lothal sector before the Battle of Yavin, used a Pelta-class command cruiser variant as their home base. The Rebels would add additional wings, which had engines in them, to this variant, making it much faster. There were also extra docking points and extra turbo lasers fitted onto the ship as well to help the ship serve Phoenix Cell's needs. The main weakness that the Pelta class suffered was that its armor and shields were relatively weak, making this ship very easy to destroy. And at around 7.2 million credits, it makes this ship pretty expensive for what you're getting. Before Admiral Akbar in Home 1, we had another famous Mon Calamari Admiral known as Radis, who captained the MC-75 Star Cruiser known as the Profundity. This would be the proud command ship of the Rebel Relief Fleet sent to Scarif to extract one small piece of information that exposed the weakness of the Death Star. At 1.2 kilometers in length, the MC-75 Star Cruiser was shorter than your average MC-80 Mon Cala Cruiser. But it was still a very heavily equipped ship. It had a lot of point defense weapons along with several batteries of turbo lasers. It also had that redundant style of shielding that most uh, larger Mon Calamari ships used. They basically used a bunch of redundant shield generators and scattered it all over the ship. This was how Mon Cala cruisers could go up against massive star destroyers and still survive. During the Battle of Scarif, the Profundity had to occupy the attention of two Imperial class star destroyers and still somehow managed to outlast them. At 88 million credits, the MC-75 represents a very serious leap for the Rebel Alliance. They're going from these smaller civilian freighters that are outfitted for guerrilla warfare to actually fielding what essentially is a warship. It took a while for the rest of Mon Calamari society to defect the rebellion. The first exodus from Mon Cala was taken by Admiral Radis and several members of the Mon Cala military right after the Empire took over. It was more than a decade later that the Mon Cala merchant fleet, the rest of the planet's naval power, finally defected as well. They would bring with them almost a dozen different MC-80 class star cruisers. Now, it should be mentioned that Mon Cala never made the same ship twice, and so every MC-80 star cruiser has its own unique size and design. But generally, these ships were around the same length as an Imperial-class star destroyer, around 1 mile or 1.6 kilometers. And while they couldn't outgun an ISD, they could outlast one because of that redundant shield system I mentioned before. Basically, the ship had much weaker shields, but a much faster recharge rate because of all that redundancy. At 104 million credits, the MC-80 isn't quite as expensive as an ISD, but it definitely gets the job done. The VCX-100 Light Freighter is another Corellian Engineering Corporation's freighter. Instead of being a YT series though, like the Millennium Falcon, it's a VCX series, which was smaller and had less storage, but more sleek and capable in a dogfight. The most famous VCX-100 in the Rebel Alliance fleet would have been the Ghost piloted by Harrison Dula and crewed by the Spectre Rebel Cell. The VCX had a standard layout with several interior rooms for crew inside. The ship had some light lasers and turrets for anti-ship operations and a small VCX series Starfighter shuttle, which was very functional and even had a hyperdrive for its own away missions. At 155,000 credits new, the VCX-100 was kind of a premium civilian ship. We talked about the YT-1300 in our previous video about affordable ships. We found it to be very competitively priced at around 25,000 credits in the used market. So instead, we'll be taking a look today at the YT-2400, another common Corellian freighter that could be converted into a light gunship or transport. Unlike the VCX series, which was designed for speed and maneuverability, the YTs were designed to tow freight and larger ships. This is why many of the YT series ships that we see have offset cockpits, so that the pilot and crew can see what they're pushing around. The Rebel Cell Iron Squadron was known for using a YT-2400 freighter against the Empire. They're also known for using the YT-24's towing capacity to bring giant containers of explosives into the battle to be used as dumb bombs. At 1,500,000 new, or 32,000 used, the YT-2400, like most ships of its class, was a blank canvas for a Starship engineer and pilot to play around with. So there you have it guys, that is our list of Rebel ships and how much they cost. As you can see, they like using a lot of secondhand ships and even stealing ships when they could. 
So cost probably wasn't as much of a factor as getting people to kind of crew these gigantic starships. Well guys, let me know in the comment section below what you think about this list. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of this series. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.